Good evening again, friends in Alconey. Good to be with you, meeting with you again, even though it's uh, through the screen again. But we are glad to be able to fellowship in this way around the Word of God. You know, the stories of the Old Testament uh, weren't revealed to us for amusement or entertainment or even, if you like, content for our Sunday school classes and our good news clubs. The stories of the Old Testament uh, are the stories of God working with his people and for his people and through his people. And there are many profound lessons to be learned from the stories that we read there. I want to read you one of those stories or part of one of those stories uh, this evening from Second Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4. We read this. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout, so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, The Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Disaster had befallen the children of Israel. Just at the beginning of the ministry of Samuel the prophet, they had gone to war against the Philistines and been defeated. 4,000 Uh, slain in battle and uh, the Israelites began to ask big questions they questioned the providence of God recognizing that this defeat was not some setback out of the control of Yahweh he wasn't a local tribal God he was the God of all the Lord the sovereign why then had he allowed this defeat to befall them why had he abandoned them to his enemies the response to the setback reveals much of their spiritual state. The elders obviously concluded that in some sense God had absented himself uh, from their predicament. And so, in their plans to counterattack the Philistines, they decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battle with them. And in this way, they thought, they would bring, they would be sure of the presence of God with them. After all, had he not declared that uh, this was the place where he would manifest himself to his people. And had he not done so during the troubled times of the desert wanderings? So this was to them a logical solution to their need and the answer to their problem. However, as one commentator puts it, it was the logic of superstition. Behind their thinking was this idea of a kind of a mechanical, automated concept of worship. It was little different from, essentially, from believing in a good luck charm, the power of a religious relic, a kind of religious talisman. It was empty, mechanical, works-based, sacramental religion. Put your penny in the religious slot, and out pops the desired answer. The elders of Israel ought to have known better. The prophet Isaiah recorded Yahweh's description of such superficial religion founded on externals. 
chapter 29, God says this, This people draw near with their mouth and honour me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. There was an external show of religious practice in Israel here, but no reality, no substance, no truth. Now you need to keep that in the back of your mind while we recount the rest of the story as it is in 1 Samuel here. The Israelites truly brought the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield, confident that its presence would ensure victory over their enemies. The confident shouts and cries of the Israelite army struck fear, really, initially into the Philistines. And they said, a God, a God has come into the camp. Uh, the idea of a kind of a tribal God, a, a national God. They had heard of the plagues of, in Egypt and how the gods, as they saw it, had, had defeated the Egyptians. But they encouraged themselves to go out and fight all the harder. And the result was that they defeated Israel again. And disaster upon disasters, they took the Ark Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant captive. The first disastrous defeat paled into insignificance for the Jews. 30,000 men died this time. But worst of all was the capture of the Ark of the Covenant. Eli the priest died of shock when he heard the news and his expectant daughter-in-law gave birth and named her son Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel. See, the Philistines with their polytheistic views regarded the Ark as another god. And then when they took it and took it captive, they set it up in their pagan temple beside Dagon, the god after whom their temple was named. Next morning, they discovered Dagon toppled face down in, on the ground. So they set their god back up in his place. But next morning, discovered him again fallen flat, this time also smashed, so that only the trunk of the effigy was left. The head and the hands were cut off and were lying on the threshold of the temple door. Along with this was an infection of tumours uh, which ravaged them and convinced the Philistines that they needed to get rid of this ark to send it back to Israel for fear that Israel's God would continue to afflict them. Now, as we reflect on this, we see clearly the folly of idolatry. But what we must not miss is that the idolatry was both in Philistia and in Israel. The god Dagon had to be propped up by human hands, clearly a false idol. But so too is a superstitious, mechanical, external form of religion in which the Israelites were steeped at this time. The idea that you can pronounce a few words, go through a few religious motions and rites, and so command God's blessing. That's as profoundly idolatrous as gods of wood and stone, or even precious metal. Now we see evidence of this kind of idolatry in the words and attitudes of so many around us. Why doesn't God stop the trouble? They cry. Despite the fact that many, maybe most of them, haven't entertained a truly serious thought of God for years. They have this idea that God is a kind of a heavenly fireman, you know, to be called upon in emergencies to get them out of trouble. A God, so-called, who jumps to their command and who is at their disposal. Such idolatry is an offence to the Almighty God, to the Sovereign Lord, who's working out his perfect purpose and his perfect will even in the strangeness and darkness of these days. God has stripped away many idols, wealth, commercial enterprise, career plan, sport, entertainment and amusement. All the idols have been stripped away. We've been reminded how empty and how worthless these are in the face of disease and death. But are men and women being brought then to their senses? Are they seeking the true God and the security and safety which is found only in serving him? Well, a few are, praise God, 
but the vast majority seem to carry on regardless. Their idols have been toppled, but they still cling vainly to what remains, hoping for the day soon when they can set up their God again in his place, whether it be the barren search for this world's success and prosperity, or the empty shell of religious rites and superstition. None of this can satisfy. None of this is of real worth. It is the expression of man's idolatry and will lead men and women to eternal ruin. Unless they repent of sin, acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, and seek from him his gracious pardon and salvation. God's command is absolute. You shall have no other gods before me. Sinners must renounce their idolatry, whatever form that idolatry takes, and acknowledge and trust Jesus as the only Lord and Saviour. Believers, you and I, in whose hearts Jesus has been enthroned, must by his grace, we must by his grace, seek to live out Christ's gift of life for his glory and the extension of his kingly rule in the hearts of men and women. Let us be done with idolatry in whatever form it manifests itself to us. Let us ensure that in God is first, that Jesus Christ is Lord and sovereign of our lives and let us serve him with gladness in the knowledge, in the assurance, in the sure and certain hope that he is working out his perfect purposes for our good and for his glory. God bless you.